Activist Kwame Touré, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, and Dr. Malefi Asante are part of this debate on Afrocentricity. This hour and a half event is hosted by the United African Organization at the University of Cincinnati. Abar Ghan. Kwame Ture was born Stokely Carmichael in Port of Spain, Trinidad in 1941. During the time of the civil rights struggle, Ture was arrested and imprisoned more than 15 times while organizing for voter registration in Alabama and Mississippi. Beginning in 1966, he was known as the foremost exponent of the Black Power Movement, which swept the African world. In 1968, Kwame Nkrumah moved to Conakry, Guinea, in West Africa, where he worked and studied with Osajifo Kwame Nkrumah, the president of Ghana. Here he, began, he became an organizer for, all, for the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the AAPRP, founded by Dr. Nkrumah. Ture has traveled and lectured all over the world as an organizer for the AAPRP. He has lectured at most of the major universities in the United States and has dedicated his life to the fight for Pan-Africanism, the total liberation and unification of Africa under an all-African socialist party. It is truly an honor to introduce to you Kwame Nkrumah. I'm um, Kwame Ture. <laughs> I ask you to excuse us, our pain, our right leg is giving us uh, constant pain and uh, we have to stay off of, the, off of the leg as much as possible. That's the only reason why we're taking the sitting position. Uh, Pan-Africanism, what I'd like to do in the 20-minute uh, period we have is to give you its general outline, its general development, and of course its uh, future path. Uh, some people think that Pan-Africanism is a response to colonialism. While certainly Pan-Africanism responded to colonialism, we must not think that it's colonialism that brought Pan-Africanism into being. Of course, to see this clearly, we should just look at the general evolutionary processes of all societies on a universal basis. All societies have a tendency to go from a smaller social aggregate to a larger social aggregate, from the family, to the tribe, to the clan, to the nation, to the continent. This is an evolutionary process. This theory can be seen in living practice if today we were to look at Europe. Europe everywhere speaks of European continental unity. Even though Europe has fought more fratricidal wars than any other continent or all the continents put together, Europe still speaks of European continental unity. Of course, Africa will unify before Europe, but that's not the point of discussion here this evening. The fact that Europe, with all the fratricidal wars she had fought, can speak of continental unity shows this evolutionary process. Africa, like any other society, anywhere in the world, was involved in this same evolutionary process, going from family to tribe to clan to nation to continent. This evolutionary process was interrupted by European imperialism. It came in two forms, slavery and colonialism. First, they took over 300 million, the strongest, out of Africa, and then they divided Africa at the Berlin Conference. So you can see that Africa herself was moving on this evolutionary process. This evolutionary process, which would lead to continental unity, and Africa will still be the first continent unified, was interrupted by European capitalism. Since it was interrupted by European capitalism, an evolutionary process, the only way that Africa can unite today is through a revolutionary process aiming at a socialist economy. If capitalism destroyed us, it doesn't make sense to use capitalism to continue with it. We must use the anti antithesis of capitalism, which of course is socialism. And certainly if an evolutionary process has been interrupted, the only way we can capture the time lost is through a revolutionary process. We state these facts only to let you know but those of us who are revolutionary, Pan-Africanists, is not because we love revolution. It is historically determined, and we have no alternative but to follow history and to use history for the benefit of our people. 
So this then is the general outlines of Pan-Africanism. So you must not think that Africa just began. Had Africa been left untrampled by European imperialism, we would have a long time achieved uh, continental unity. Secondly, Pan-Africanism must be seen as a movement, a mass movement. And this mass movement must be properly understood. Africa, of course, because of racism, is belittled everywhere. And many people do not see Africa's constant, constant, underline the word constant, contributions to uh, world civilization. In the, uh, since the 1940s, Africa has given, even before the 1940s, actually we can go back to the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Africa has given to world political movements a mass character. Africans revolt in masses, never as a vanguard party. If you look at the independent struggle in Africa, it was nothing less than mass. If you look at the struggle in the Caribbean for independence, it was nothing less than mass. And even in the United States of America, the only movement they call a mass movement is our movement. Therefore, this mass character must be properly understood. Pan-Africanism has this mass character. Africans have this mass character in responding. And our responsibility is to bring this mass character together, make it precise, so that it can direct its blows at the enemy, hitting him, hitting him, hitting him, until we knock him down. Therefore, the, the task of Pan-Africanism is to gather the masses of our people together in the same organization, irrespective of where they find themselves, be it in Europe, be it in the United States, be it in the Caribbean, or be it in Africa. This is the first aspect then we must understand. Pan-Africanism found its organization expressions in 1900. Here, a Pan-African conference, here the word conference, was organized by Africans from all over the world. They came together deciding that something must be done for Africa. The, one of the leading organizers of this uh, conference was a man by the name of Henry Sylvester Williams, born in Trinidad, a man whom you should do some history on, a very, very great man. Uh, Doc, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois attended the conference, but he was not one of the leaders in 1900. By 1917, 1918, uh, the idea of a necessity for a Pan-African uh, Congress, not conference, Congress, was to be called. But most of the people who did the conference were dead. Henry Sylvester Williams was dead. A lot of them were dead. Du Bois was about the only one who was alive. Du Bois recognized he had a historic responsibility to continue the work of Pan-Africanism, so he called the first Pan-African Congress. Make a clear distinction. The first one in 1900 was a conference. Du Bois being intelligent, understanding that a conference is limited and a congress has more elasticity and can go longer, called it a Pan-African Congress. From the 1990s up until 1945s, we could say seriously, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois just about single-handedly kept the flame of Pan-Africanism alive. One thing must also be underlined to you. Pan-Africanism was brought into being in its organized form by the Africans outside of Africa. This was done only because of the oppression of Africa. At that time, Africa was under total colonial domination. There could be no political meetings. As a matter of fact, if you had the paper of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, you could go to jail. So the conditions were such that it was difficult for the Africans on the continent to organize. Africans off of the continent, recognizing this, came quickly to fill up that gap. So an Africanism itself was brought to bear by the diaspora. But you must not think that the diaspora brought Pan-Africans for the diaspora. Not at all. The center of the discussions has always been Africa. This must be properly understood. Some people try to shift it, make it take it somewhere else, but Africa has always been the focus. Du Bois carried on his uh, congresses up until uh, the fifth congress in 1945. Because of time, we're just going through them uh, quickly. In 1945, saw the uh, fifth Pan-African congress. Here, you had Africans born on the continent in the Caribbean, and uh, Africans, of course, born uh, in Europe and the United States. At this fifth Pan-African Congress, there were three co-secretaries, of course, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Padmore of Trinidad, and uh, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. So he had an African from the Caribbean, one from the United States, and one from the continent, who were co-secretaries of the fifth Pan-African Congress. The fifth Pan-African Congress is crucial for us. A decision was made there. They said that the final confrontation with colonialism is coming. After all, this is 1945, and you must know that there's negative and positives in everything. I remember once as a young man reading Mein Kampf on an airplane, sitting next to a woman. She said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean what I'm doing? I'm reading uh, Mein Kampf. Why are you reading it? I said, well, Hitler's a very important man. He had historical effects on the world, you know. I'm, she said, well, I'm a Jew. I said, have you read it? She said, no. I said, oh, that's bad. I said, have you not read Sun Yat-sen? She said, no. I said, he says, the first law of war is to know the enemy. If I were a Jew, I would read everything there is to read on Hitler. Of course. Of course. 
So while reading Hitler, she was arguing. I said, well, Hitler had some positive effect anyway. She said, what positive effect did Hitler have? I said, Hitler weakened European imperialism. He weakened the British, he weakened the French, he weakened the Portuguese, he weakened the Belgians, and that's how we got independence. So these are facts of life. These are facts of life. When Hitler got through with Britain, when the Indians said they want independence, Britain could do anything but get out of the way and let them have independence. As a matter of fact, they got Mohammed Gandhi quick because they didn't want to deal with the armed struggle that the Indians were preparing for British imperialism in India. And by the time India was free, well, it was over. China came up after China, of course, Africa throughout, etc., etc. And by 1960, by 1960, in 15 short years of the declaration of the Fifth Pan-African Congress in 1945, two-thirds of the African continent was independent. You must understand clearly the importance of this. Now, at the Fifth Pan-African Congress, they said the only solution to the final confrontation is mass organization. And I say, if you look at Africans, we have nothing but mass character in our struggle. Of course, this mass character for the moment is spontaneous and must be transformed to something that's planned and permanent. But certainly the mass character is there. If you just look back to the uh, Rodney King situation, those Africans who rebelled, rebelled in mass. They had no planning. That's how backward they were. They didn't think about it. Just on the spot, they said, okay, it's too much. Let's go, let's get them. And everybody said, okay, let's get them. And we rise up as mass and we get them. And then we sit down for 29 years. Of course. But the mass character is there, and we must understand this uh, mass character. The Fifth Pan African Congress, most of Africa, of course, was colonized. Kwame Nkrumah came to change all this. By 1958, he threw the British out of Cape Coast and named it Ghana. And Nkrumah declared before the entire world that the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it's linked with the entire continent of Africa and its unification and liberty. And Ghana and Krumah made Ghana the base for every movement that fought against colonialism. Mugabe, who's now the head of Zimbabwe, where was he trained? In Ghana. Go and ask all of them. And Krumah set up freedom schools, teaching how to use arms to go and fight. It was Nkrumah who built the base and pushed Pan-Africanism. He understood that Africa was divided in 1865 at the Berlin Conference and that we cannot accept divisions imposed upon us by our enemy. Africa is one, we must unify her. This has been the task. Of course, since Nkrumah, the movement picked up. The independence of uh, Guinea came in the same 1958, later that year, and with Secretary and Kwame Nkrumah, the movement really uh, coalesced force. The Pan-African movement, of course, was not going to be left alone. Imperialism would seek to divide it. That's their job. Secretary says, if the enemy is not doing anything against you, that's because you're not doing anything. Of course. As a matter of fact, when they're not doing anything against me, I get scared. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> so uh, their job was to divide, and if you will look, they divided the Pan-African movement in what was called the Casablanca bloc and the Monrovia bloc, the revolutionaries and the reactionaries, to put it in one simple word. Of course, the Casablanca group included the fighting forces in Algeria, the NFLN, which the other African states refused to recognize. Of course, Nasser had to be in it. Of course, Nkrumah, of course, Sekou Touré, Tunisia, and of course, Mohammed V in uh, Morocco, who had just waged serious war to uh, get independence away from the French. The other group was called the Moderate Group, and they were all made up of uh, reactionaries and scum of our race who didn't want African unity and raise a million problems and sabotage it and work for imperialism against the interests of their people, and that still continues today. I always say one of the uh, weaknesses of the African Revolution is that we are the only people who allow our enemies to strut with impunity amongst us. It's only because of our weakness, it's only because of our weakness, it's only because of our weakness. Of course, another weakness is that, uh, and this one is a very painful, that uh, we have to leave our wounded on the battlefields to be picked by the vultures. We cannot even pick them up. We cannot take care of our prisoners, uh, the families of our prisoners who are in prison. I mean, we're just very, very weakly organized. But uh, we are revolutionaries. We don't look for easy tasks. We look for difficult tasks. We leave the easy tasks to those who do not wish to advance. We know man and woman can only advance before difficulties. Therefore, we look always for difficulties. We said they divided Pan-Africanism, and out of that a compromise was made called the Organization of African Unity. Many people think that the Organization of African Unity is Pan-Africanism. It is not. Pan-Africanism cannot be built from the top down, and the Organization of African Unity is an organization of the heads of states in Africa. Pan-Africanism must come from the bottom up, from the masses of the people up. It is here then that we come to see the real aspect of Pan-Africanism. 
We said that in the Fifth Pan-African Congress, they called for mass organizations, and immediately mass organizations sprang up throughout the length and breadth of the African world. The Conventional People's Party, a mass party, sprang up in Ghana. The Democratic Party of Guinea, a mass party, sprang up in Guinea. Throughout the length and breadth of Africa, you had the TANU, the Tanzanian African National Union, which is now the CCM. My Swahili is uh, not as good as yours. It's Chumpa, Chimpuraza, Mazuri. That's very good. Oh, <laughs> my, my Swahili is bad. <laughs> Thank you. Chapman, Pudusi. Exactly, exactly. And uh, that's their new party. But all over Africa, mass parties sprung up. If you look at the Caribbean, mass parties sprung up. And if you look at the United States, mass movements sprang up. So the call was heeded for mass confrontation. Of course, the Fifth Pan-African Congress made two definite and precise resolutions which I want to uh, highlight. Of course, Pan-Africanism from the very beginning was anti-colonial. From the very beginning it was anti-colonial. It was weak. So when they came, they didn't say to the Queen, we're going to put you out of the country. They said, you must treat the natives right. You must educate them. You must prepare them for self-government. These are things that are weak, but they were anti-colonial in essence. We must not look at the form. And we got stronger, the more this anti-colonialism will express itself. Now, anti-colonialism is nothing but anti-capitalism. Because colonialism is nothing but an offshoot, an aspect of capitalism. Therefore, if you're anti-colonial, you must be anti-capitalist, if you're logical in your thinking, of course, and your actions. Some people are not, but we are speaking of logical people here. Yes. <laughs> if you're anti-capitalist, then you must be socialist. Capitalism cannot unite Africa. Africa has to be united by socialism. Now, there's a lot of confusion here on this question of capitalism and socialism. Just recently, a young man said to me, but socialism died. I said, it did. He said, yeah, hear about it. I said, I missed the funeral. <laughs> of course, he spoke about the betrayals that occurred in the East. You must not let capitalism confuse your thinking. This is a struggle which Pan-Africanism takes on. We struggle against imperialism in the illogical arena because many people think that capitalism just wants to exploit your labor. It wants to confuse your thinking and make you think just like them. And this is where the real fight occurs. So therefore, this struggle of confusing the thinking, I told the man, I said, you're talking nonsense. Socialism cannot uh, uh, disappear, it cannot die. He said, yes, it can. I said, no. He said, how do you say that? I said, well, you are judging uh, socialism by socialists. You don't do that. He said, I've never heard such nonsense. If you don't judge socialism by socialists, what do you judge it by? I say, you judge it by its principles. Every system is judged by its principles, never its adherence. So he still saw confusion. He said, you're just talking double talk. I said, okay, do you judge Christianity by Christians? <laughs> so we must not be confused here socialism doesn't fall because of betrayal no system does the person who betrays themselves goes to the mud but the system with its eternal principles keep marching on if a system fell because of betrayal Christianity would have been finished with Judas at least Judas had the dignity to hang himself ah, ah. <laughs> Some of these who betray socialism don't have that dignity. Gorbachev still runs around speaking and I'm picking up 30 pieces of silver everywhere. Yeah. So uh, socialism is an economic system and there can only be two in the world, capitalism or socialism, because every economic system must answer one fundamental question. Who will own and control the wealth of the country? Who will own and control the means of production? The question can only be answered two ways. Either a few will own or everyone will own. It's as simple as that. And under capitalism, we say, Please summarize that we might have. No, I'm going. I thought I had 20 minutes. It's my time. I thought I had 20 minutes. I was going by the clock. How much time do I have left? I'm sorry. Maybe I'm off. That's what I thought I did. I was watching it. I'm watching my clock. I'm a responsible. I'm re revolutionary. I go by time. <laughs> In fact, I can say it in two words, black power. <laughs> and today we've gone to one, Pan-Africanism. <laughs> yeah. So there are only two economic systems, and it's going to be capitalism or socialism. Capitalism is a backward system. There's no need to discuss it. Certainly anyone who's been made a slave by capitalism ought to be hesitant in trying to support the system. But as a conscious African, I must be against capitalism, and I must, of course, seek to destroy it. So in, when you speak of Pan-Africanism, you must understand you speak of socialism. And we want to underline there's only one socialism out here, and that's scientific socialism, whose principles are abiding and universal. There's no such thing as African socialism, Chinese socialism, Russian socialism, Arab socialism. There's only one socialism. The confusion arises over ideology. That is that which guides you towards your objective. 
So we're saying clearly here, Pan-Africanism is not an ideology. It is an objective. It is an achievable. Pan-Africanism is the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. All we want is a unified continent with a socialist system. That's all. But you know Africa is the richest continent in the world. When she's properly organized, she'll be the most powerful. Yeah, of course. Of course, and me, all I want is power. <laughs> I'm not like others, I don't want money, I don't want popularity, I just want the power I'm supposed to get. That's all. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> and Africanism is moving into its final stages, which calls for mass organization. The All-African People's Revolutionary Party, founded by Osagifo, Kwame Nkrumah, has already outlined this in his book, The Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. There are many uh, people here in the audience who are members of our party, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party. We have chapters in America, we have chapters in South and Central America, we have chapters in the Caribbean, we have chapters in Europe, and of course we have chapters in Africa. Our job is to unite all these Africans together. We're not worried, we stand squarely on our history. The Honorable Marcus Garvey did this already a long time ago, therefore it's not anything new. And uh, those of us who know our history know that it will spread like wildfire. But Africanism then is revolutionary, it cannot be anything else. Pan-Africanism is the only solution for Africans because, as the Honorable Marcus Garvey never ceased saying, until Africa is free, no African anywhere in the world will ever be free or respected. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Is the mic on? Thank you. Can you hear me? Where's the, where's the sound, man? It's on? Well, uh, I would like to thank Mr. Thank Mr. Toure and uh, next we'll have Next, we'll have <laughs> Next, we'll have Ms. Lasalia Hunter, who is a member of our Central Council for the United African Organization. She'll be introducing Mr. Malefi Asante. Dr. Melissa Keita Asante is professor and chair, Department of African American Studies at Temple University, the premier center for the graduate training in African American Studies. Considered by his peers to be one of the most distinguished contemporary scholars, Asante is the author of 38 books, the latest are Classical Africa, African American History, A Journal of Liberation, Malcolm X as, cult a cult as Cultural Hero, Love Dance, Poetry and Illustrations, and The African Intellectual Heritage, edited by Asante and Dr. Abua Abari. He has published more scholarly books than any contemporary African author and has recently been recognized as one of the 10 most widely called, no, I'm sorry, widely cited African Americans. Asante received his PhD from UCLA at the age of 26 and was appointed a full professor at the age of 30. At the State University of New York at Buffalo, he is the creator of the PhD program in African American Studies and the director of more than 60 PhD dissertations, making him one of the major producers of PhDs in the nation. He has written more than 200 articles for journals and is the founder of the theory Afrocentricity. Indeed, his book, Afrocentricities, The Afrocentric Idea and Kemet, Afrocentricity and the Knowledge, are the key works in the field. Sought after as a speaker and consultant nationally and internationally, Asante was born in Vastada, Georgia, one of, his, one of 16 children. He is a poet dramatist, painter, and gardener. His work on African culture and philosophy has been cited by journals such as journal, the Journal of Black Studies, Mhotep, Journal of Communication, Western Journal of Black Studies, and Afrocentric Scholar. Recently, the 
Utni Magazine called him one of the 100 leading thinkers in America, and Asante has recently recommended was recently recommended in a survey as one of the 25 inf influential African male leaders in of the last 200 years. He appears regularly on shows like Nightline, Night Talk, BET, McNeil and Leary, News Hour, Today Show, and The Tony Brown Show, and Night Watch. He has received honorary degrees for his community and educational work. Asante is the founding editor of the Journal of Black Studies, and was the president of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee at UCLA in the 1960s. Recently, he was made a tr traditional king, Nana Akuru Kita Asante Karubia I, and um, Shadihini of Tafu in Ghana. Dr. Asante has been or is presently a consultant for the school district of. Detroit, New York, Baltimore, Camden, Cleveland, the Virgin Islands, Trenton, New Orleans, and Gary, Indiana for writing curricula. An activist scholar, he believes it is not enough to know one must act to humanize the world. I introduce Dr. Maleke Asante. <laughs> Barry Gunny. Assalamu alaikum. What's up? <laughs> I want to thank the United African Association here at the University of Cincinnati uh, for this opportunity to have a discussion uh, with one of my heroes. Uh, I must tell you that those of you who do not know, because some of you are perhaps very young, uh, you are having a very great uh, occasion tonight to be in the presence of someone who has uh, made his mark and is making his mark on our history. Kwame, T <laughs> we, we we don't often recognize sometimes the people among us and here is a, a man who uh, has done so much for the African world and I remember when I was a student and working with uh, SNCC at UCLA uh, he was uh, at that time uh, one of the individuals that I most respected and I still uh, respect him quite a lot that doesn't mean that I agree with everything he says. <laughs> but quite correctly, however, I don't think that there is much that he said tonight that I take a lot of exception to. I am normally not used to debating people that I agree with uh, so much. I mean, they normally have me pitted with Dinesh D'Souza or Arthur Schlesinger or Mary Lefkowitz or somebody like that. But tonight I'm really delighted to be able to explain what I think might be some differences uh, in the discussion that we have heard from uh, Kwame Torre. Afrocentricity is a theory that says that African people can never achieve unity until we first have consciousness. Consciousness precedes unity. Unity operates on the basis of common interests and objectives. The African world, indeed African people here in the Caribbean, on the continent of Africa, all of us have been moved off of our own terms, psychological terms, political terms, economic terms, philosophical terms, cultural terms, linguistic terms, fashion terms, name terms, whatever. We've been moved off of our terms. We're not operating on our own terms, normally. 
when you are moved off of your terms and you are not operating on your own terms and you do not view yourself as an agent, that is as an actor, as one capable of acting in any context, then you will never be able to create Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism or any movement must first of all fundamentally be based on the notion that individuals see themselves as subjects, as centered, not as objects on the margins of Europe, not on the fringes of the European experience, not imitating or following after Europe, but are centered in their own African experience as African people and view themselves from that particular perspective. That, of course, means a number of things. That it is the European intervention in the last 500 years that is most responsible for moving us off of our terms. I will never forget reading once what Makale said about the Indians in India when he was a colonial administrator in India. That it was the purpose of the British government to make of the Indian people British in opinion British in desires, British in ideas, British in aspirations, in everything British except in color. And I think that when I consider the situation with African people, both on the continent of Africa and in the diaspora, I have to assume that the same purpose or the same intent or the same mission was meant for African people, consequently to move us off of our own terms. That's why I always say that colonization and enslavement, twins of the capitalist domination and exploitation of African people, have been just as effective with us as with other people, but even more so when you think of the fact that more African people have been destroyed at the hands of this domination. Let me explain something. Slaves are not born. Slaves are made. But how do you make a slave? You make a slave by creating the loss of memory. If you create the loss of memory and you create a historical amnesia, then it becomes possible for individuals to no longer remember. And when they no longer remember to whom they are connected, their own traditions, then they will follow any tradition. But you cannot have, therefore, on the continent of Africa or in the diaspora any unity that would bring about any Pan-African idea. We have, as Kwame Torre has told us, since 1900, since Sylvester Williams, we've been talking Pan-Africanism. But you know why we have not had an effective Pan-Africanism operating? Because we have not had a philosophical base Af without Afrocentricity, you cannot have Pan-Africanism. You can have a discussion about it. You can have rhetoric about it. You cannot have, you have to have ideas. You must have interests. You must have institutions, mechanisms for carrying out Pan-Africanism. But you cannot have ideas or interests or institutions until you have African people on the same page. Negroes do not talk to Africans. And black people don't want to have anything to do with colored folk. And on the continent of Africa itself, we are suffering today and the fratricidal wars on the continent itself because we do not have a philosophical base. I mean the Hutu and the Tutsi. 
This is a good example. The innovation of Europe is creating a situation that has not allowed consciousness. We don't have the same mission in mind. And that's why we don't have any African governments. I lived in Zimbabwe, not as long as Kwame has been in Guinea, where I lived there. But I didn't see an African government there. I wonder whether or not we had one in Guinea. I haven't been there, I can't say that. But in the other countries, 27 countries I've been in, I haven't seen any African governments. What I have seen, I have seen African people in government. I have seen African people running government. But I have not seen an African government. Because African people do not yet have an Afrocentric philosophy. In terms of the masses, of course, we have, we have Afrocentric clubs in Sierra Leone and Ethiopia, Zimbabwe and Nigeria and other places, but, but I mean the masses. So that what we have in the governmental structure would be individuals who are imposing a European system of government on the masses. So you got black people in government, but they have never truly understood the intellectual ideas, the conceptual ideas, the political ideologies of their own people. You will never have anyone who will march into the royal palace at Kumasi and have a coup d'etat on the Asante Hine, the paramount king. It may happen in Accra with a modern state government, but it will not happen with a traditional government. Because we have never taken the, 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 leg, the legitimate ideas and concepts of traditional African society, the thing that made those societies legitimate in the eyes of people and employed them in the modern governments, we have had problems over and over again. Take the empire of Ghana. It lasted 1,500 years, from 300 BC to 1,240, when Sandiata, the king of Mali, defeated Sumanguru, the emperor of Ghana. Of 1,500 years, how did they do it? Do we even investigate it? Do we ever even think about it? And let me just say this, that when we talk about Afrocentricity, we are not talking about the philosophy that is anti-anybody. We are talking about a proactive African philosophy, African people as centered, as subjects, as actors. We are not merely to be seen or, only, or to be seen at all on the fringes of the European experience. We are ourselves people with ideas, with our own concepts of politics. And as for economics, I think that we have to navigate between the deformations of socialism and capitalism. And I don't see capitalism and socialism as the only alternatives. And this is why um, and Kwame said that African socialism wasn't a good idea. Julius Nayeri wrote a whole book called African Socialism. And I think that basically what uh, the president of Tanzania was, he was trying to deal with was this whole question that somehow we should not be pitted between one European idea and another European idea that Africa itself has contributed enough in terms of how human beings deal, that we don't have to be stuck with the heavy baggage of historic failure that we see both in capitalism and in the worst forms of socialism, bureaucratic authoritarianism, regimented regimes. I mean, the collapse of socialism in those instances, in those examples, should be enough 
to at least make us wonder how in the world or why in the world would we follow after false gods? It would seem to me that the Afrocentrists would rather say that Pan-Africanism comes about or can come about fundamentally when we first of all have a clear understanding that strategy is better than strength. That not only is strategy better than strength, but once we have a strategy based on our own interpretation of ourselves and history, we will understand that common origin, common objectives, and common condition are what create unity. I mean, we can talk about the unity of Europe and how Europe is unified, but Europe is unified on the basis of common interest when it's unified. And I believe that the future of Africa is in the hands of those who truly understand that for African people to be free, to be liberated in our own minds, is the first step toward developing a Pan-African unity between African peoples. At this time, we're going to give the audience a moment to collect their thoughts, so let's keep that. Oh, I guess we're going to go right to the, the questions. Uh, and Ms. Jameson Hall, the moderator, will take over from here. here, <laughs> but I got a Pan-Africanism without going through Afrocentricity. I didn't go through Afrocentricity to get to Pan-Africanism. I arrived straight at it, and Pan-Africanism has been around a long, long time before Afrocentricity. We said the first Pan-African conference was in 1900. Just because we've not achieved Pan-Africans today doesn't mean it's not achievable. That sounds like maybe you've got uh, some uh, confusion with the American capitalist system of uh, everything is instant, you know. Instant coffee, instant this, instant replay. But freedom is not instant, it is an eternal struggle. Therefore, from 1900... <laughs> therefore, from 1900 up until now, and I began by showing you that it started when we were first interrupted. Do you think that the Africans who were put into slavery were not fighting for Africa? They didn't fight, they waited until Afrocentricity? No. The struggle continues. Afrocentrism is only a term. It doesn't give the content of the struggle. The struggle is always there. There's a scientific law. Wherever there is oppression, there is resistance. Even if you cannot detect it with the naked eye, there is resistance. Look at the United States of America. They went all over talking about their NAFTA thing. They thought they had everything under control. January 1st last year, the Japowers jumped up, started shooting up everywhere. Where did they come from? Wherever there's oppression, there's resistance, even if you don't detect it with the naked eye. And I know that wherever Africans have been oppressed, we fight. Multiform, but we fight. So uh, I don't understand that point. Capitalism and socialism also seems to be a tendency here, the Afrocentrists. You know, one of the errors I think they make is that they allow, hear me carefully, they allow the particular history of Europe to become the universal history of the world, and then they react. No, not me. I know the particular history of Europe is not the history of the world. I know this. I know this. I know Africa has made great contributions to humanity, great contributions. Capitalism and socialism are economic systems. They have absolutely nothing to do with Europe. 
Karl Marx did not invent nor found socialism, even though many people say that. He just discovered it. That's all. He discovered the laws of socialism. He didn't found it. We call in America the laws of gravity Newton's laws, but Newton cannot invent that a body falls at 32 feet per second squared. Marx cannot invent that where capital oppresses labor, that labor will rise up and overthrow capital. Marx cannot invent this. As a matter of fact, I would like Professor Asante to go and read Iban Khaldun, an African in Tunisia in the 12th century, who in his writings used terms like surplus, surplus value, property, rights of property. He used all the terms that Karl Marx used, and he wrote in the 12th century, and he was an African. The values of socialism are to be found in communalism, and I'm sure Professor Asante knows that communism lasted longer in Africa than any other continent. Therefore, obviously, those values are there, easy for us to bring alive to a socialist system. Socialism and capitalism has nothing to do with Europe, just like air and water has nothing to do with Europe, though Europe will let you think that they invented both air and water, and you might think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing that came to my mind, just off the top of my head, was first of all that Ibn Khaldun was a racist, and I have read Ibn Khaldun, um, and he said some very negative things about African people. So, but let's get to the heart of the matter. Um, if we, for example, uh, take the notion of Europe, and we look at uh, Europe in terms of it, uh, 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 particularism, and Afrocentrism, I don't know any Afrocentrism who look at Europe in the sense of universal, uh, as a universal culture. In fact, what the Afrocentrists have argued is that the particular expression of Europe has uh, been imposed on other people as if it is universal, that the Europeans have done that, that in fact the Europeans have done that with, with all of their concepts whether they speak of uh, the classical world and they impose that as if uh, it's only Greece and Rome, or whether they speak of classical ballet and impose uh, uh, that as if it's only the dance of Europe. The, the whole notion of the imposition of a particularism as a universalism really is, um, is, is not an Afrocentric notion. It's a notion of, it's a Euro, European notion, and that's what they have done. So. We don't, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't uh, project that and then attack that. We see that uh, as uh, part of what has happened to African people. That African people, for example, in terms of, uh, uh, say, Pan-Africanism, if we take Pan-Africanism as an objective of African people, that is, the unification of Africa and the, and the African world uh, and African people, if we see that as an objective that an objective itself is, is not a program. An objective is not a philosophy. Uh, Pan-Africanism as a goal is not a philosophy. And so it is true that you can have Pan-Africanism, uh, Pan-Africanists uh, before Afrocentricity, but those individuals like, for example, Kwame Nkrumah, who articulated the idea of Pan-Africanism uh, in a concrete way coming out of his philosophy of consciencism was what you might call an incipient Afrocentrist. He, wouldn't, he didn't say that, but any individual who says that our particular response to the universe must be from our own culture is an Afrocentrist. I mean, that's a person who's an agent. That's a person who's an actor. Kwame Nkrumah believed fundamentally in an Afrocentric worldview. But, you, but what I am saying, my position is that if you say you are a Pan-Africanist and you are not Afrocentric, then the question is, and perhaps Kwame Torre can answer this, are you a Eurocentrist? <laughs> <laughs> um, more questions that I'd like to ask before we take our break and then turn it over to the audience. <laughs> the, the first one is, is addressed to both of you. Um, Dr. Sandy, how does Afrocentricity address women's oppression? 
And for Mr. Ture, how does the All African People's Revolutionary Party address women's oppression? question. Africa gave to the world the very first queens centuries ago. And if my memory serves me correctly, it's a little pamphlet written by Professor John Henry Clark. He points out through great documentation that every time a queen was on the throne and Africa was attacked, there was no compromise at all. John Henry Clark points out that during the reign of our queens in Africa, Africa advanced technologically, economically, and in every other arena. Therefore, as a conscious African, I would understand clearly that I could be easily directed by queens. The only queen you read about in the Holy Quran is a queen that comes from Africa. The only queen you read about in the Bible are queens from Africa. Therefore, it is clear here as a conscious African, I understand the role of women. Africa gave to the entire world matriarchy on a continental-wide basis, where here the woman has the power and inheritance passes through her. Therefore, I understand this. The destabilization of our society was caused by colonialism, making a woman then become the slave of the slave, clearly. So she now suffers triple oppression, not only from the colonials, but from African men themselves, who instead of fighting the enemy, tries to take out their frustration on the women, which is certainly backward. There's no question here. The way to solve, the way to solve the problem, the way the All African People's Revolutionary Party solves the problem is that we have looked at history and other organizations. We have inside of our party the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. Women are oppressed because they lack organization. That's why they're oppressed. Consequently, if you're really as serious about liberating women, you let women create their organizations and give them the power. The All African Women's Revolutionary Union is the most powerful arm inside our party. There is no other wing of our party that's organized like they are. They're the most powerful. We will never have an All African Men's Revolutionary Union. Men oppress women. If you want to stop the problem, you break down the organization of men, you create the organization of women, and you let things roll. The women will come to their rightful place. Therefore, our position, women must be organized, and they must be organized to fight for themselves. They will not be liberated by their brothers, by their husbands, or by their lovers. The philosophy of Afrocentricity believes that the liberation of women, uh, much to in the same order as uh, Samora Michelle once said, is not an act of charity. And because it's not an act of charity, but a fundamental necessity for any mature people, the Afrocentric uh, position is that we must challenge any death-producing system of gender warfare, class warfare, race warfare, sex warfare. And women have not as much right, but more uh, right uh, than men who have oppressed them as paternalists and in a patriarchal system than anyone else to fight this liberation struggle. And Afrocentric women are fighting the struggle. Uh, Afrocentricity does not take a, uh, a position um, against uh, women, and we uh, strongly believe in the historic role of women from the time of Hatshepsut and before who have participated fully in the governance and the direction of African affairs. I mean, we have in our own history, of course, tremendous uh, examples, and we name them Fannie Lou Hamer, Anna Julia Cooper, for example, and so forth. So uh, Afrocentric, Afrocentricity as a philosophy uh, certainly uh, is, a, is perhaps the most progressive uh, position that one could have because it's about agency. It's about women taking their own agency. It's about uh, women seeing their own sense of being actors as being um, centered and subjects, uh, as being initiators, as being those who are responsible for their own perspective and viewing uh, the world through those eyes. 
So Afrocentricity in that sense is fundamental to the liberation of women. born in America, how do we prepare ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually for this revolution? To me. To me or to both of us. To you, sir. Uh, the way we do that is by joining organizations, because revolution must be done through a systematic manner, and organizations must do it. One of our weakest aspects as our people is that we're totally disorganized. We can come together in a minute, a million or more people, and then sit down and forget all about it. We have no sustaining power because we have no organizations. Therefore, to correct this, each and every one of us must join an organization. This has been our constant theme. I, all my life, I've belonged to organizations. All the great people I know belong to organizations. Malcolm X was so bad that when he left the Nation of Islam, he created two organizations. You know, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated and the Organization of African American <coughs> Unity. Martin Luther King was a bad brother. I knew him, I had a chance to see him, but he had an organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Fanny Lou Hamer, a bad sister, she has an organization. Asada Shaku, bad sister, she got an organization. Angela Davis, when she left the Communist Party, quite quickly went to the Corresponding uh, Societies for Correspondence. Everyone, and I've always been in organizations all my life. Our people do not belong to organizations. They think that they are great, they are supermen, they are greater than Martin Luther King, greater than Malcolm X. But once we begin to humble ourselves, we will join organization, and once we all become organized, freedom will follow just like the sun follows the moon. Thank you. Questions? I just respond to just say one thing. I agree with uh, Brother Torre, except that I would just add one thing, that it seems to me that we are, we are organized. I mean, if you look at all the organizations in the African-American community, the so-called not-for-profit organizations, the churches, there's a lot of organizations in the black community. Uh, so it's not so much organization that we need, but organization with purpose. See, I, 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 don't, I, don't, um, I don't think that, I think that we have to be careful about just simply saying organization. We need to be in organizations that are clearly defined, their missions are clearly defined, and they have a purpose. Otherwise, we're simply just, um, we don't have the proper vehicle to get us to where we think we need to get. To save time, I want to take you to a logical conclusion. Listen to my statement. Bad organization is better than no organization <laughs> at all. <laughs> you heard my statement. The fact what you say is not true. Less than 3% of our people belong to organizations. Go anywhere you are among Africans, ask them, which organization you belong to? I don't believe in organizations. Which, are they just guys? They're corrupt. They're taking the money. They ain't doing it right. You know Farrakhan ain't serious. 
you know, all they can do is criticize they don't belong to organizations. Asking you how many people belong to organizations, you will see. We do not belong to organizations. This is a tragedy. We have more organizations than any other community in America, but less people organized in them. The NAACP has less than 2% of the population's members. So how can you say we're organized? Just well, we're well perhaps we have different statistics. It seems to me that the, that the great uh, number of African Americans are in churches. Those are organizations. But they're not the kind of organization that will lead us to where we need to get to. But they're in organizations. Black people are in organizations. And I think that what we really need uh, sorry, to I'm, talk about... Sorry, it's very clear. I said uh, organizations struggling to free the people. I but then we, we agree. Okay. <laughs> but I, I, just, I, just, I, just, I, just took, I just took your idea of precision. Yes. And I wanted to make I was sure, sure that I, I was precise. Before. I said it before. But I also want to let you know now, during the 1960s, those churches did a hell of a lot of fighting in the South. That's right. And produced some awful, powerful preachers like Fred Sutherwood, C.T. Vivian. That's true. Is enhanced by the agreement between you two because I was just about to say that after synthesizing what Mr. Ture had to say and what Mr. Ashanti had to say, it seems like it's a kind of a word play. Really, both positions really support one another. I think before we can have uh, Pan-Africanism, we've got to have a, our own cultural terms and viewpoints. So our, our schools, curriculums, both on the continent and in the States, in the Caribbean, wherever we are, has to be similar. Today in Africa, we all read, I read European history. I didn't know anything about myself. I was born and raised in Nigeria. It makes me a caricature of the European, not the black man that I need to be. So in order for us to Pan-Africanize, We've got a Afrocentric size. Thank right. you. So, so my question is to Mr. Kwame <laughs> <laughs> Ture. And we've we've gone way back, you know that. So would you address my position? Which is, in order for us to pan-Africanize, we've got to first of all Afrocentricize. But this, but this, but this can only question. understand it. But this could only be done in an organization, my brother. If you sensitize yourself, of what good are you to the rest of us? And you can't even sensitize yourself. It must be done in an organization. Unless we're organized, we're not doing it. Our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, in 1972, told everyone that we're going to make Africans in this country use the word African, and we're not going to do it through the press. We rolled up our sleeves and went to work. They even call themselves African Americans today. Soon they're going to get rid of the Americans and come right home, Africans in America. <laughs> so you can't centralize uh, by yourself. It has to be in an organized form. I want to let you know now, if you speak of Pan-Africanism, you speak of organization, of revolutionary organization, as precise as that which the Vietnamese had when they destroyed American imperialism. Um, Brother Ture, my question is to you. On the issue of African government, do you agree with Dr. Asante on the point of the African-ran country is non-existent? He's, uh, he's probably correct. The overwhelming majority of our leaders all over the world represents nothing but the scum of our race. That's just a fact. That's just a fact. Yeah, it's a fact. Thank and, but, you. But, uh, but, of course, he well knows that uh, since independence, great moves were made to carry out what we're speaking about here. Kwame Nkrumah made them, uh, Julius Nerere making movements, uh, Sekou Toure, of course, Patrice Lumumba, uh, Nasser, uh, uh, Gaddafi is still making them. So uh, these attempts were made, of course, the job of the imperialism to knock them down one by one and make it appear as if there is no alternative except neocolonialism. But Kwame Nkrumah informed us that neocolonialism is the last stage of imperialism. We're going to knock it down and go straight to a unified socialist continent. With that point, with that point being made, with that point being made, if that is the case that we are up against, as far as our continent, Mother Africa, then how can we align ourselves here in America and other parts of the country that's a true unity if we don't have a country that is ran by With the mass people? of the people. For example, the All African People's Revolutionary Party has great relationships with many organizations, revolutionary organizations in Africa. Many of them. We have relationships with the Democratic Party of Guinea. We have relationships with the uh, African uh, Party for Independence in Guinea, Guinea, 
games now in Cape Coast, PAIGC, <laughs> since they split. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've had relations with all the liberation movements, Zapu, Zapu, MPLA, Frelimo, PAC, ANC, Swapo, Zapo, etc., etc. We continue these relationships. The relationship for us must be made with the peoples, not with the governments, when the governments are corrupt. In Libya, you have a serious government. That was, no, Gaddafi is not corruptible. That's what they don't like about him. That's what they don't like about him. He cannot be corrupted. Do you agree with that, Zaka? I, yeah, I think I basically agree with that. Thank you, brother. Yes, my name is uh, my name is Deville. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. 27 year old businessman, own my own business, uh, record label. I'm an artist. I have other artists that's down with me, and um, we positive for the black. You know, we ain't uh, racist. We respond to racism. I just wanted to take a few seconds, probably about a minute and 10 seconds, to just drop something for y'all and everybody that's in here, okay? I just... I'm taking you to another style while serving the same serious subject. I'm leaving the Edomites in the dust, trying to get brown people to retrospect and check and charge people to panther that's pale and pink. He's trying to get and be a tan man, but he cannot stand the original man who's black, but also sometimes call us brown. But we were the first to see the sight, to hear the noise of sound. Here's proof in the Bible that says the man was made from the dirt of earth. Bad news to the pink people. Uh-oh, oh no, there's no pink dirt. So here's some advice, pink people get it fixed Cause a big, big, big bunch of the Bible took place in Egypt Yet and still you let to Jesus Christ movie come on my TV And I see nobody, no one body with a complexion the same as me This really makes me sit back, start cracking up I'm laughing at you cause you act like you don't want me to know that Egypt is in Africa but for me, it's easy to squint and see the brainwashing things you do. So I tell blacks and average whites to get them against and mad at you. I do this only so to know the place you trick to keep control. But blue-eyed devil, I'm warning you now, you will be selling your soul to the brown-eyed devil. Two fingers. <laughs> Let's get the, the, the questions. Thank you very much for the questions. It was a rhetorical question. <laughs> this question is for uh, uh, Brother Toure and Brother Asante. Uh, you're both arguing good points. But what's of interest to my mind is, Brother Toure, what is your view of African centricity? And Brother Asante, what is your view of Pan Africanism? So, uh, I think from what I've heard tonight that uh, uh, Dr. Toure is uh, trying to claim a lot of people as Afrocentrists. Of course, I was very shocked when he said Kwame Nkrumah was an Afrocentrist because. Uh, I don't know why the word Afrocentric, why not uh, African uh, thought uh, instead of Afrocentric uh, thought. Uh, I do not wish to put uh, Afrocentric thought in Europe, I just want to keep African history clear and then uh, look at the history of Europe, look at this from the eyes of an African. Uh, the fact that uh, we've always said that the ideology must come from culture is nothing new. Well, the Honorable Marcus Garvey said this, uh, so and that's been a long time ago, of course. Uh, if you read Nkrumah, Nkrumah said, I've read all the great books in the world, I've read Hegel, I've read uh, Marx, I've read Lenin, but he says the book that fired my enthusiasm the most was the principles, the philosophies and opinions of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. And so it's clear that when you find a lot of writings, if you trace them back from Nkrumah, you find them going right back to Marcus Garvey. Uh, Africans have always fought, fought cultural struggle. As a matter of fact, we think one of the problems with uh, European revolutionary movements is that they didn't wage cultural revolution. This was done outside of Europe since the 60s. Mao Zedong raised a cultural revolution. In Africa, cultural revolution. Throughout uh, uh, Central and South America and the Caribbean, cultural revolution. So cultural revolution has been waged. Cultural revolution has to be waged by those who've been colonized because they first have to get their culture back in their hands in order to guide their movements forward. So when you say that Afrocentrism needs this, it's a fight, first of all, to regain the integrity of our culture. 
And this fight you have to wage, it's a serious battle for. It doesn't just fall from the sky and then you read a lot of books and said, okay, I got my thoughts together, let me go out here and fight. No, it's in the struggle that you become a politically aware. Not away from the struggle, it's in the struggle because it's only action that verifies theory. <laughs> That's what the man asked. Very good. Very good. You, you knew where I was going. Right? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Pan Africanism to me is, is the goal, the objective of the unification of Africa. It's, the, it's, a, it's a grand objective. Whether or not it will be realized in the next 100 years, I do not know. In fact, uh, I hardly think so. The reason uh, it cannot be realized in the next 100 years is because we do not have the mechanisms in place, the institutions in place, to articulate a commonality of interest of African peoples. In fact, that is what I believe uh, Brother Torre is working toward. But I, I don't think that you can effectively create that uh, without having uh, some common consciousness on the part of the people. And consciousness, in fact, may come through struggle, but it does not necessarily come through struggle. In fact, one of the things that we learned in Southern Africa was that when the people in Mozambique claimed that the revolution was itself a university and all we had to do was to get people involved in the revolution and we would have change in their attitudes, what we discovered was that after the revolution and the people came out of physical struggle they were still psychologically enslaved. In fact, if you go to Zimbabwe right now, and well, let's not even take Zimbabwe, let's take South Africa. If you go to South Africa right now, you will discover in South Africa that the masses of people, even though they had gone through struggle, at least in part, are still psychologically and culturally and educationally and economically dominated. So struggle is not necessarily the, ve the vehicle for consciousness. It ought to be, and in most instances, it can be. Good, e good evening, brothers. My name is Victor. Um, you know, I'm listening to the discussions and the explanations of Afrocentricity or African-centered thought, how, however one would, would perceive to define it in our limited English language, and then also uh, the concepts of Pan-Africanism. And to me, I seem to absorb both equally well and easily. It seems like my right side understands the critical thought necessary to organize and seek out organization, and my left side understands the creative thought necessary. I don't see why there should be a really, maybe I'm perceiving this wrong, but I'm trying to get, please, please understand that a, a soundbite question won't help me get to what I want to get to. I'm gonna hurry up. The problem there are many is, people behind you. Okay, okay, the problem that I see is that I don't think there's one before the other. I think they must come together. And I think at the same time, I'm worried about what I have seen in many black movements, and that is the support of a totalitarian state, though a black nationalist one, or a technocracy, a black nationalist one, that doesn't really foster the ideas of freedom, and in my idea, democracy, and I'm not using that in a European sense. So please help me with this, this concept here and, and offer some reassurance that neither one of you are doing something that would eliminate our, our freedom and our ability to grow as a people, that we're part of this movement. You understand, brothers? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think, yeah. 
think, yeah, I, I think that uh, that even taking uh, taking um, a, a, a Kwame Ture's uh, notion of Pan-Africanism and scientific socialism and Afrocentricity, I think that we are both uh, totally committed uh, to uh, human freedom and to uh, the fulfillment of the human personality and to the expression of social justice. I mean, I don't think, and I think that we're committed to participatory democracy. Uh, so uh, I don't think you have to worry about that. But I think that I agree with the top uh, end of your question statement uh, regarding the fact that uh, Pan-Africanism on one hand, uh, you understand with your right side of your brain, I guess you said, and, um, and uh, Afrocentricity with the left. Uh, that's, that's plausible, and it's plausible in ways that I wish I could get my brother Kwame Torre to understand uh, that it, I, I, have, I believe in Pan-Africanism, and I think that it is possible that the uh, political uh, philosophy of socialism uh, might uh, have something to contribute to some form of African communalism that we may not yet have explored. However, it is fundamental that Pan-Africanism not be viewed simply as an objective without a vehicle. It has to have an intellectual content. It has to have some perspective so that when I view someone from Nigeria or from Ghana, they will not see me as not being a part of the African continent. In other words, we had that problem in Dar es Salaam, where there, and we had it in Lagos and Festac, where there were continental Africans who did not want Afro-Brazilians and Afro-Cubans and Africans from the United States to be a part of the colloquium because they felt that they were somehow not African or they did not control government. This is only because there was no philosophy. If there had been an Afrocentric philosophy where we understood that wherever we were, in whatever capacity, as African people, we were self-actualizing, we were actors, we were agents, and we would, we would have greeted each other. But that cannot happen until you have a philosophy. And there is no philosophy that moves Pan-Africanism that way. Let me, uh... And I think that we have, I think that we have reached for socialism because we never created our institution. Uh, let us try and use precise terms from a revolutionary point of view. There is an objective and an ideology. There's been much confusion in the world uh, since the uh, 19, uh, 1900s and uh, this confusion was spread and uh, unfortunately aided by the Soviet Union. But Marxism-Leninism was the only revolutionary ideology in the world. Of course, uh, as a young man studying Marxism-Leninism, this created a lot of confusion for me. The first aspect of the confusion was found in the fact that if one is a Marxist-Leninist, one must be atheist. Certainly atheism in the African community <laughs> they, went, you go, you tell them, they said, no, you know you believe in God. No, you know you believe in God. You ain't no atheist. <laughs> you know, so there's just no way. And the second point was their limited view on nationalism and its role in struggle. These are my two conflicting points. Of course, there are many other. I'm just pointing out two. So since the 1960s, those of us who are conscious strugglers have been really examining this problem. Conscientiousism was written in 1964. It was called, subtitled, Philosophy for Decolonization. Therefore, the philosophy is giving. Our party has as its objective, I've never said anything since tonight, I've said Pan-Africanism's objective. Our ideology is encrumism to raisin. Therefore, we do, and that, that I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know, but anybody who's familiar with our party knows that our party's ideology is encrumism to raisin. Our objective is Pan-Africanism. Therefore, it's the thoughts and actions of encrumism to raisin, which represents all the struggles of Africans who came before, Cabral, all the others, leading us to Pan-Africanism. So we do have this problem solved for our party. We agree with you. There is much confusion around Pan-Africanism, and most Pan-Africanists do not have an ideology. Some try to use Martin Leninism to get them to Pan-Africanism, that caused a lot of confusion. I just gave two examples, but our party has no confusion here. And Crimism Tourism is our ideology leading us to Pan-Africanism. We have about 15 more minutes before we close, so would you please um, continue with your questions? How 
does the Pan-Africanist and the Afrocentrist view the role of spirituality or spiritual culture in the liberation of African people? Uh, Africa is a uh, very uh, spiritual continent. If we were just to isolate our contributions to world religions, we would see this. The first sacred book in the world was written by Africa, in Africa, by, written by Africans in Africa over 6,000 years ago. It's incorrectly called the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Uh, thanks to our struggle by many of our intellectuals today who have applied their skills to the people's struggle, they've come to show that the real title should be the Book of Coming Forth. I imagine this is your area you know much better than I. It was Africa that gave to the world monotheism, belief in one God. It was Africa that gave to the world Judaism, and this one must be properly understood. Because here are a lot of confusion comes into play, and Zionism plays an evil role here, trying to confuse everything. Uh, Judaism was given the world by Africa. It could only be given the world by Africa, because in that part of the world, the only place where monotheism had been accepted and was breeding was in Africa. If you looked east to Africa, in Persia, they were worshipping the sun. To the north of Africa, in Palestine, they were worshipping idols and would do so until the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his name, came to uh, give them monotheism in the form of Islam. So it was Africa that gave Judaism to the world. I know the first Jews in the world were Africans. That's why I'm never confused. They call me anti-Jewish. I'm anti-Zionist. I can't be anti-Jewish. My people gave you the religion. Yeah. On the question of Christianity, again, Africa's role is, you know, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, was in trouble, it was only Africa that gave him refuge. That's where he grew up as a young man, learning and growing. The very first country mentioned the Bible, Genesis 2, verse 13, uh, is you know, Nubia and Ethiopia. If my memory serves it correctly, I think in the Bible they're called Havila and sometimes Cush. That's Genesis 2, verse 13. If you just take statistical analysis of the Bible, you will say Egypt and uh, Ethiopia is mentioned more than Israel. Of course, we know the role of Africa in uh, giving protection to the uh, disciples of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his name, when they were in trouble. And even given refuge to uh, Joseph when he was sold by his brothers into uh, Egypt. So Africa is very spiritual uh, society. This spirituality must be respected and must be understood. But. Uh, by this, we do not mean that this spirituality broken down to religions. That's where people get confused between spirituality and religion. We just want to make that clear. But Africa certainly has, uh, throughout the continent, a great sense of spirituality, and one which, uh, even if you're not African, when you're in the continent, you become amazed at. I don't need to add very much to that. Uh, in fact, uh, what I do need to say, however, is that in terms of uh, Afrocentricity and spirituality, uh, we, we believe and we also uh, think that in terms of uh, spirituality that it is necessary first of all to understand how African people view the universe. Everything is everything and if everything is everything then it is also possible for us to see how one develops ethics, morals, values and so forth. If the earth does not belong to you, but belongs to all the people, then there are certain ways you treat the earth. I mean, there are ecological assumptions that can be developed. Uh, how you treat the rivers, how you treat the trees. Uh, the spirituality of African people, which is fundamentally uh, based essentially on the idea that we all, we all are part of the universe, and we are part of each other, means consequently that relationships are basic to African spirituality. Our relationship uh, to the ancestors, our relationship to uh, the unborn, our relationship uh, to the deities, our relationship to uh, nature, all of these things are relational. And th this is the fundamental part of the African spirituality. And we have not often, it seems to me, since we have been on this side, awaken ourselves to uh, the full potentiality of our spirituality. And it is different from religion, because religion in this country, 
maybe everywhere, religion becomes, whether it is Islam or Judaism or Christianity or Hinduism um, or Yoruba, religion becomes the deification of your nationalism. It is the making sacred of your historical traditions. And consequently, it is different from spirituality. We're open to the spiritual challenges of the world on the basis of our uh, being a part of the total universe. Next question. My name is Nana and uh, uh, Brother Ture. We were last together in Accra in 94 with Maya Angelou at the Padmore uh, Conference. And my question to you and uh, uh, Professor Asante, he's kind of clairvoyant, he almost answered it, but my question to you is how do you, given the historical persecution of Africans on the continent and in the diaspora, how do you reconcile socialism and capitalism seeing that historically neither has seemed to work for African people? And, and to Professor Asante, uh, how do we reconcile the differences that seem to be vast between continental Africans and Africans primarily in uh, North America? Well, uh, I don't understand your statement where you say that uh, socialism has not uh, worked uh, for Africans uh, and how you can bring both of them together. Where our principles are concerned, there is no compromise, there is no middle ground. Uh, either you tell the truth or you tell a lie, there is no middle ground. Either you believe in God or you do not, there is no middle ground. Capitalism is an exploitative system. Either you're for an exploitative, sy exploitative system or you're for socialism, a non-exploitative system. And there can be no in-between between, there's no in-between between slavery and freedom. For me, capitalism is slavery. Socialism is freedom from the economic chains which capitalism holds us under. Of course, I may be incorrect, but this is my logic. And you must understand my logic. That well, you know... <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't want to ask uh, uh, Professor Torrey this question, so it's going to be rhetorical. And that that question was following on what the brother said. Uh, could he give an example of where socialism has worked? But I'm not going to pursue that. Uh, let me just. Um, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> I know you wouldn't. <laughs> but but and we and, and we should get on this question of principles and the Christians um, because I, I I make my judgment. On, on Christianity on the basis of Christians, but that's another story. In, in response to the question, you know that. <laughs> in response to the question about the continental, I have never had any difficulty with continental uh, Africans. So I, I, whenever I hear this question, it always um, bothers me, and I always try to figure out what the uh, situation is. And I think it has a lot to do with the approach. You know, that um, uh, Africans on the continent or maybe Africans in the diaspora take toward each other. But uh, as an Afrocentrist, I take a fundamental um, uh, approach, which is that the enslavement and the colonization experience of both of us uh, really put us in the same condition. And consequently, I see uh, people in the Caribbean and on the continent uh, and in South America as my brothers and sisters. And so I, I think that perhaps with me, I would argue that a strong uh, uh, Afrocentric orientation uh, toward Pan-Africanism might be a solution to that problem. Well, they're beginning to talk about it. Yeah, but they're beginning to talk about it. That's what I'm saying. He said that Africans don't talk about Afrocentricity. Well, Afrocentricity is only 16 years old as an as a intellectual philosophy. And, and uh, Afrocentricity, the book, came out in 1979 or 80. So it is relatively a new a philosophy. But already you have, for example, Herbert Villacazzi in uh, South Africa, one of the professors there is a strong uh, Afrocentric uh, scholar. Uh, you have many in, in Africa. I mean, I could name them in Congo and Zaire and so forth. So there, there are a number of people uh, throughout the continent of Africa, even in Nigeria and Ghana, who consider themselves to be Afrocentric philosophers, uh, uh, thinkers. So uh, 
so what I would argue is that the more we have the kind of consciousness that we're talking about, the better it will be even for the kind of relationship that we should have. Okay, I'm going to make this just real quick. Okay, my name is uh, Peter. And the only thing I would like to know is uh, what's the concept that will be finally uh, enacted. My question is how will we finally be able to uh, come to a solution to stop the corruption among, you know, even, the, even those that would be in charge? You know what I'm saying? That's all I would like to know. Once we finally arrive at these particular points, you know, how do we safeguard against the corruption? That's, that's all I got. Thank you. The only question is through a mass organization, which uh, without pity and without mercy, stampedes our corruption into oblivion. That's the only answer. Anything short of that will not do it. The reason why our, our leaders are so corrupt is because they don't have to account to anyone. They do not have to account to anyone. There's no force from people organized, making sure that they're in power and they will carry out nowhere. So they do whatever they want to do. They're held accountable not to us, but to our very enemies. Even here, you can look at the United States of America. After we shed blood to get the vote, they become mayors and become more corrupt than the white mayors. And the reason they do this is because they have no one to hold accountable. The only answer is organization. When we're properly organized, when we're properly organized, this problem of corruption will cease. Because once you have an organization, you can deal retribution. We said in the very beginning that one of the weaknesses of the African Revolution was that traitors to the revolution struck in our community with total impunity. And I mean, they struck. That's right, in the 1960s, I snitched for the FBI, I got this brother killed, this brother went to jail, and they just struck. Nowhere else will this happen because of our lack of organization. Therefore, if you're really concerned about it, it must be organization. I want to tell you now, I do not have any immediate solutions to our problems. The only solution I have is constant struggle. Constant struggle. Constant struggle. And this struggle has to be matched with constant political education of the masses of the people. Constant political education of the masses of the people. And of course, you know, in the back, our party always uh, recruits, and in the back, when you go out, you find a table of our responsible small party, brothers and sisters who try hard to organize us. If you're interested, you should stop by there. If you want to join our party, of course, we always invite you to, but ours is a revolutionary party, a serious party, so if you're not serious, go to another organization and you but do whatever you can, but now is serious. <laughs> Just one more question. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry our time is running out. This has been a great experience, but I think we can only take one more question. Mr. Toure has the plane to catch. One more question. Yeah. Hi, my name is... Uh, um, this question is directed towards Mr. Toure. Um, I would like to know, how would you see the masses taking Pan-Africa socialism and placing it in America? Would this goal be accomplished by legislation, economics, force, or a combination? By any means. <laughs> Looking for a little more direction. Think about when you say that. Huh? I said, I guess my question, my question just asks for a little more direction. No, well, that's a question of the organization you join. We have, we have a map worked out. Uh, is anybody in our party has any propaganda which talks about and tourism by chance? You have peace? Please uh, make sure that Dr. Sante gets it. Uh, we, no, I'm sorry, really, I thought you knew this. I really did. I'm sorry. You know, we solved this problem. Of course, you know, we, we've just been revolutionary circles, but we solved this problem. Uh, so it depends. Our party has a solution. If you go to the local mosque here, the minister of the Nation of Islam, he's here, is he not? Minister James, is he here? He left. Oh, there he is, right. If you go to the Nation of Islam and you should visit it, they give you another program. If you go to the NAACP, they give you a program. Your job is to decide which program you think is the correct program to lead us to freedom. And if when you go to the Nation of Islam, you find, oh, they're just talking a lot of nonsense. You go to the AAPRP, they're just talking nonsense. You go to NAACP, they're just talking nonsense. Well, then you do what is necessary for all of us. You create the organization that's going to lead us to freedom. Dr. Sander, do you have any response to that? Uh, the only response I have is that we all have to uh, collectively revise the, the, the text of our people. And we collectively revise that text by struggle, by constant struggle and vigilance. 
and the National Afrocentric Institute, which is my organization, uh, tries to do that uh, very effectively. So uh, uh, I've enjoyed the discussion with uh, Kwame today. Thank you. Thank you all. And Kevin has a word for you. Thank you all very much. Shall we give him a hand?